Hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. I hope you're all you're all doing well. Uh, this is our closing event for Digital Gala Week. Um, it's a, a virtual Californian road wine trip. Uh, before I introduce our speaker for the talk, I wanted to run through just a few housekeeping points. So, uh, firstly, we're recording this session. Um, and it will be available on the website tomorrow morning. So feel free to share it with anyone that you think might be interested. Um, if you'd rather not be um, on the recording, then um, feel free to just switch your camera off. Uh, there'll be plenty of time at the end of uh, the session for questions. Um, so if you could please use the chat function for that and I will um, pass them on to Claire. Um, and finally, if you wouldn't mind keeping your microphone muted while Claire is speaking, uh, that would be great. Thank you. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Celia and I'm the Alumni Relations Officer here at Claire. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker uh, for today's talk, Claire Tooley. The eagle eyed amongst you may have uh, noticed the two letters after Claire's name, MW. Mm. Uh, and it stands for Master of Wine. So we're going to be in very good hands today. Now, uh, Claire was a choral scholar and studied French and Spanish at Claire. She began her wine life in London with John Armit Wines after completing her degree. 
In 2000, she joined Direct Wines Limited as a buyer and moved to France in 2006, where she lived near Bordeaux, managing the group's winery and traveling extensively in North America, Europe and Asia. Claire is a Champagne Academician. I hope I pronounced that right. and uh, has been inducted as a Chevalier of Burgundy, Bordeaux and Champagne. She now lives in California with her husband and two sons, where she is Director of Wine Development for Lionstone International. Her job involves sourcing for national wine clubs, including the Wall Street Journal, Lathwaite's Virgin, TCM, NPR and National Geographic. So I'm going to hand over to Claire now and Cheers, everyone. Claire, over to you. Cheers, my goodness. Thank you so much, Celia, and welcome, welcome. Um, Really lovely to be here with you today. It's eight o'clock in the morning here in California. I've opened the wine. I hope you have too. I hope you all have something delicious in your glass. And I would love to hear what you have in your glass. So please tell me in the chat and we can talk it through um, uh, towards the end. Also, any questions you have at any point, I would really be delighted to... um, to hear those and to hopefully give you some kind of um, intelligent response. So welcome. We're doing something slightly ambitious this morning, we or this afternoon, wherever you are. Um, uh, We're doing a road trip in sort of 45 minutes um, uh, uh, up through California, through some of um, the extensive wine lands that there are in this very, very beautiful part of the world. Um, I say ambitious. there is no way we can cover anywhere near uh, the diversity and um, beauty uh, that this state offers the world in terms of wine. And were California to be an independent country, um, it would be the fourth largest wine producing country in the world. That's how vast, that's how eclectic, how diverse this state is. And I have to admit that before I moved here, um, I had really no inkling of um, just how uh, magnificent and sort of bountiful in terms of wine California is. So I hope I do it justice. Um, I will share my screen. I have a few pretty pictures for you to um, uh, to try and sort of liven the um, uh, the presentation up a little. So bear with me. I will um, uh, I will start that. Um, there are three things really that you need to know about California. Why that? Why there is wine in California? Um, the trifecta that comes together to create um, possibly one of the most um, uh, uh, interesting wine regions in the world. And I and I use that term um, uh, with with care. Um, I have been fortunate enough to live elsewhere, and um, my entire career has been about discovering wines from all over the world. So to, to say that California offers something quite unique is, um, is, no, is no small statement, but I stand by it. And there are three reasons um, that California has wine. The most important, um, the Pacific Ocean. Without the Pacific Ocean, um, there would be no vineyards, there would be no wine. This is a picture taken on one of my very favorite beaches, Carmel, and um, it's a vast ocean, as you know, it's a very cold ocean. Um, That cooling influence um, is basically California's uh, air conditioning system. Um, Without it, we would would, um, not have the the fruit, the nuts, the vines that we have in California. California is obviously the salad bowl of, of the US. The cooling air comes in in the morning in the form of fog. It rolls through, up over the coast, over the mountains, up through the tributaries and into the vineyards. And it really only burns off sort of middle of the morning, 10, 11 a.m., leaving this sort of sweltering, sometimes heat, but really sort of condensed, um, warm, ripening period. And then magically uh, cools down in the evening so that you're um, in shorts in the afternoon and, and, and sort of wrapping yourself up around the fire by the evening. And this not only allows um, the, the cooling influence, but also the fact that it prolongs the growing season in California for, for, for vines, for, for grapes. And what that does is basically ensure a certain quality um, because it achieves acidity as well as ripeness in the fruit. 
So the ocean brings the weather. It also brings people, of course. Um, this is a nation of tourism, of immigrants, of movement of people and thirsty people. Uh, so another reason for the sort of growth in uh, the wine industry that we've seen here over the last um, few decades. The second thing of the, in this sort of trifecta of, of um, uh, of reasons why we have wine in California, not so pretty, but incredibly important. Um, basically, the tectonic plates that we're living on here, the sort of knife edge existence means that these earthquakes and the shifting of um, plates um, has, uh, has created a patchwork of different types of soils up and down the coast. This picture of the 1906 San Francisco um, earthquake, absolutely devastating, of course, in terms of human cost, but in terms of what it brings to the soils, um, this, as I say, this patchwork, um, again, is a, is a sort of a dream come true for grape growers. Um, it means they can plant all sorts of different varieties that suit different soil types. You get the sort of limestone in Paso, you get more um, volcanic soils in Napa and Sonoma, sandier as you go further north. Very important, therefore, for the sort of qualitative aspect of California wine. And then on the right, this awful triggering picture of the fires. And I don't want to dwell on them. It does trigger. Um, this, unfortunately, was the hill that I used to live on. Um, the house was saved, um, actually because of the thanks to the vineyards that were planted around it. Vineyards are actually very good fire breaks. Um, but it was terrible. This was back in 2017. And unfortunately, we've had fires um, every year um, since then, and no reason why they will stop, unfortunately. But the good news or the good, the, what comes out of it is a certain sense of resilience, a certain sense of uh, practicality. Um, uh, California wine industry never stands still. It looks for ways to uh, mitigate these sort of natural disasters and, and, and perhaps take advantage of them. And finally, what brings it all together, of course, are the people. I love this picture. This is a picture of the end of Prohibition. Um, Prohibition, of course, was, uh, again, decimated the, the wine industry here in California. 94% of it disappeared. Um, those that stayed were, were either bootlegging or um, making wine for the church. Um, big celebration, of course, for everybody once that uh, finally came to an end. But California is a nation of movement of people. Um, the first pioneers, um, the missions were planted vineyards, brought great varieties over from Europe and, um, and, and promoted this sort of culture of wine drinking. Um, Count Harasti uh, was a Hungarian count who came over and he brought with him cuttings of vineyard vines from, uh, from European vineyards and planted them in Sonoma. And Buena Vista was his first winery, first established winery. It's still going today, still going very strong and it is owned by a French family, the Boisset family. Um, so this sort of melting pot, if you like, um, that is California has a huge influence on what has been planted here in terms of, what, of grape varieties and the style of wine that's been, uh, that's been created and brought to the world and brought to the US in fact, since so much of uh, Californian wine stays in uh, the US. Um, but this pioneering spirit, I think, is something that you feel very strongly here. Um, I, I see it every day. I meet uh, winemakers, vineyard workers from, from all over the world who've come to, um, come to California in search of, in search of a golden life, um, a hard life, uh, but certainly um, that influence has been very much felt within the wine industry. So all of these things together, what do they actually mean? They actually spell uncertainty. Um, and in that uncertainty, in that movement, there is opportunity. Um, and California has been at the forefront in the wine industry of finding solutions. This was here um, that the first real um, experimentation was done on, on water management and sap sensors that are attached to the vines to, to measure the water in the, in the knowledge that we're living in a, in a drought. Um, and you see that again and again, and I think it's something that is um, worth pointing out when in the context of a global wine industry that is so often 
traditional, uh, slightly caught in, um, in possibly in the past. Um, California is, is about looking forward, it's about taking advantage, and it's also about making sure that um, fundamentally it can be sustainable in an environment that is um, trying its best uh, to, uh, to, to, to stop us. Um, the vast majority of uh, US wine is made in, in, in California, uh, well over 90%. Um, I would love you to take a little time afterwards later, another time, uh, just to click on this link and watch um, what the Californian wine industry is, um, is promoting itself as. Um, it's a three minute video. I'm not gonna show it now, just so that I don't sort of break my, break the system. But it's a, it's a wonderful clip. Uh, I know we're going to share it in the chat. Um, and it shows, um, uh, it, it's an interesting take on, um, on how the industry feels about itself today, and therefore I think um, of interest to, um, to those of you who um, want to know a little bit more about California wine, but I'll leave it, I'll leave it with you for another time. The most important thing uh, right now is to start, um, to start on our glasses of wine. I hope some of you have already started. Um, here's a map of California. Um, as you can see, um, there are all these colored areas on this map are our vineyards, our wine areas. Um, most people think of wine from California as coming from Napa and Sonoma, just to the north of San Francisco. Um, as you can see, um, the vineyards stretch right up to the Oregon border up in Mendocino and come all the way down past San Diego, down towards the Mexican border. Um, and I can honestly say hand on heart that there are wines from all of these areas that are are well worth discovering. Um, unfortunately, for those of you living in the UK, it's not so easy to find. Um, you have to come over here. <laughs> um, we're doing our best to bring more uh, to the UK market, but it's been a little bit of an uphill uh, struggle, partly because of this little area you can see inland, which is the Central Valley. Um, this is where Gallo is, um, is, is based, although Gallo also owns some beautiful estates up and down the coastal uh, line of California. Uh, but a lot of production is coming from that Central Valley, much warmer, much hotter, juicy, ripe, um, sort of berry flavoured wine. Um, on the coastal regions, you'll see much more diversity. And that's obviously, as I say, because of the, um, because of the ocean. But we're going to start um, this morning, this afternoon, uh, in one of, my, um, uh, one of my favorite valleys. We're down in, um, near Santa Maria, down in the Edna Valley. So this is part of Santa Barbara County. Um, there are a lot of saints up and down uh, the Californian coast, all obviously um, thanks to the uh, missions um, and their, um, their dominance. Um, one of the most beautiful mission buildings is actually in the Santa Barbara. It's the one that's, sort of that's most uh, pictured, if you like. Edna Valley is a relatively small valley. Um, it runs east, uh, west to east. And the importance, the significance of that obviously is that the air from the Pacific the breezes and the, and the fog rolls in, making it an extremely cool environment, very cool. Actually, even at the heat, even at the um, you know, midday, um, it's actually a much cooler, um, fresher environment, um, which is possibly why I like it so much. But it's, it's also home to more white grape varieties and even great white grape varieties that are um, often or more, more usually semi-aromatic, so less, so not more shy. And yet, because of the cool environment, you're, they're able to, to, to grow these and make very delicious wines. And the first wine, first wine I have um, in my glass is from there. It's actually a Chenin, a Chenin Blanc. So um, I've chosen varieties this morning, which I hope will surprise you a little in, in terms of what California is doing. Um, this Chenin has all the normal aromatics that you would expect, that sort of um, white pear, um, acacia honey. Chenin is quite shy, as I say, it, it develops as, um, as it um, grows in, uh, as, it, as it ages from high quality uh, places, but it has, Chenin is known for its acidity. Um, and what this wine has 
surprisingly perhaps, is this really steely linear acidity that really grows in intensity in the mouth. Um, again, not what, maybe what you would expect from, from California, um, but it, it certainly delivers. Um, and it will mean that this wine will also age. What I wanted to do was to show you the, show you the bottle. Um, so this actually comes from one of the wine clubs that I work with over here in uh, California. This is TCM, Turner Classic Movies. And we do a range of wines um, with them uh, that honor uh, the stars of the past. And this is our Montgomery Clift um, homage. Uh, we have wines um, for, for, for all sorts of different stars. Um, Burt Reynolds is my, is my, is my latest um, Cabernet. But I wanted to show you that because I think what's important about Santa Barbara is recognizing the fact that it's also so close to LA. It's also um, become, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your, um, uh, your views, um, a hotbed for cannabis growing, marijuana. As we know, um, Marijuana has been in California for forever. This is nothing new, but what is relatively new is the fact that legislation has now meant that it is entirely legal, both for medicinal and for recreational purposes. It can't cross state borders, um, but it can stay in California. And LA is a, is a, is a huge center for, um, for marijuana. Santa Barbara County, as a wine growing county, has had to live with that and has had to uh, understand how to coexist alongside this um, growing burgeoning industry. Um, and what's important to understand is that marijuana, cannabis plants and vineyards actually require this very similar uh, environments, altitude, um, a diurnal contrast, um, water, uh, cropping, so labor intensity, because they harvest at the same time. And Santa Barbara is suffering as a result. Um, there have been various sort of local petitions to try and keep the cannabis plantations to a, to a, to a, um, a minimum. But, um, but watch the space. It'll be very interesting to see how the wine industry reacts to this. And now I'm going to bring you to Paso Robles. So we're in the car. We've come up a little bit from, uh, from Santa Barbara and we're going to stop under the shade of the beautiful palm trees that, um, that surround this extraordinary building. This is Hearst Castle, um, the uh, tycoon um, of, the, of, the, of the media industry, um, who was an extraordinary collector of... Um, artifacts from all over the world. Some, some may say a looter. He certainly brought an awful lot of things back to this extraordinary castle. Um, and it is worth a visit. It is, it is a very, very impressive estate. Um, Paso, where it sits, so Paso Robles is um, a, a beautiful red wine specifically area of production. Um, and I would go so far as to say that, um, you know, second only to Napa and Sonoma counties, which we'll get to in a little while, um, Paso produces the highest quality reds in California. Um, but more specifically, they have concentrated on Rhone grape varieties. So their signature, if you like, are um, Grenache, Syrah, Mouverdre, um, Tanat, Cunois, all these great varieties that would normally, that you would associate with the Rhone, um, do extraordinarily well here in Paso. You have a cooling influence of the Pacific, but it's also a very hot um, growing area. So Grenache loves that, Syrah loves that, it, it thrives in those conditions. And I think really um, that the, uh, the, 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 one of the reasons for this, um, uh, this, this, this bringing together of, of Rhone varieties there was really thanks to a partnership um, between an American a Californian family, the Haas family, and a French family, the Perron family, who um, had been established in the Rhone with their estate, Chateau de Beaucastel, for, um, for centuries. They, they met um, back in the 60s, they formed a great friendship. Um, and um, eventually, in 1989, uh, established Tablas Creek Winery. And my second wine um, 
comes from there, from Tabras Creek. I'll show you the bottle as well. These are wines that you should be able to find in the UK, I would say, quite easily. They have good distribution there. I'm not sure whether you can see this. Tabras Creek Vineyard. Um, and the one that's in my glass is their En Gobelet, which is a classic Rhone blend of Grenache, Mouverdre, um, Syrah. Um, and if you put your nose in it, I know that, I know that you, you can't, but just bear with me. Um, uh, it smells very much like the Rhone. And, and the Rhone for me is, is this hot stone, um, a cornucopia of dark red and blackberry fruit um, shot through with garrigue, um, lavender and thyme. I mean, it really takes you to, to where it's grown. And, and this, this has all of that, but on top of that, it has this sweetness, this sort of kernel of ripeness um, that is really, uh, for me, always a marker for most California wines of this quality. Um, it manages to have all of that intensity, um, but also just with a little kind of lick of, of it's not additional sugar, it's not, it's actually natural berry ripeness, um, which makes it really, mm, just delicious, really Moorish, um, really generous, really plump and ripe, um, but also just steely enough, just enough acidity to make sure that it will um, age in the bottle. So I really, really recommend Paso to you. I recommend you looking for wines from Paso Robles. They also make um, some absolutely wonderful Cabernets, um, uh, less Merlot, but more, more those sort of dark skin varieties um, and certainly this sort of Rhone blend. The Perrin and the um, Haas family who came together to, 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 to create Tablas Creek were very specific in what they wanted to do. They wanted to recreate what they had in the Rhone. And it took them a long time and, and a lot of searching through California at various different sites to find exactly the right soil type. And this goes back to my previous point about the sort of movement of the tectonic plates, the earthquake effect, if you like, and um, that they, what they found in Paso was exactly the same limestone based um, soil type uh, that is found in the Rhone. And so they, they jumped on that and said, yes, this is, this is where we're going to start planting. This is because we believe that this will give us um, what we're looking for. Um, and I think for me, what that sort of tells you is this idea that um, pioneers over here in California do awfully well because, because there's such a, 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 a landscape of opportunity if you're prepared to put in the time to look specifically for very for very specific things you'll find it eventually because there's a bit of everything here um, and certainly um, the wines that are now being made at Tablas Creek are for me quite exceptional and I would I would highly recommend um, looking for them so we're moving up we're moving up to um, uh, to the highlands. So we're going now from, we've moved up from Paso Robles, we've passed Monterey, um, and we're going up to Simone and um, the uh, Santa Lucia highlands. These are vineyards that are planted at altitude, um, beautiful landscapes, quite rugged terrain, um, and uh, they're home to estates such as Ridge. And the reason I'm showing you a picture of um, the late Stephen Spurrier is partly as a homage to, um, to, to Mr. Spurrier, who I was very fortunate to meet and have worked with over the years. He sadly passed away at the beginning of this year um, and is greatly, greatly missed by the industry in general, in, in, in total. He was a charming man. Um, he also leaves behind a, a beautiful um, English vineyard uh, making sparkling wine. So, um, but Stephen really um, was extraordinarily influential. Um, whether he knew, recognized that at the time or not, probably not, um, he certainly came to recognize that um, as we celebrate this year, the 45th anniversary of what became known as the Judgment of Paris, which was a wine tasting that um, Stephen put on in Paris in his, um, in his shop uh, uh, in the 70s. He was a, an early, early fan of California wines and uh, felt that they needed a little boost, that, that they, he wanted them to be 
better known in Europe um, and thought that it would be fun to do a tasting of some examples of Californian wines next to the greats of Bordeaux and Burgundy and sort of at the last minute decided it would be even more fun uh, to do that tasting blind um, and bring in experts and, and just get them to taste the wines without knowing what was in their glasses. And of course what happened um, was um, a little unexpected and certainly caused um, extraordinary uh, chagrin amongst um, the French at the time and that basically the Californian wines did very very well. Um, he did a flight of Cabernets and a flight of Chardonnays, put the Cabernets um, uh, against uh, Bordeaux top chateaus and the Chardonnays against um, Burgundy uh, top estates. Um, and unfortunately or fortunately depending on your point of view, um, as I say Californian wines uh, pipped some of the top wines to the post um, and one of them, in fact, was um, uh, the Chalone Chardonnay, which was 1974 vintage. It came um, third in the lineup. Um, uh, and the first place was also taken by a Californian wine, um, Chateau Montalina. But all to the point that tasting wines blind is, um, is an extraordinary, um, uh, uh, difficult, procedure to do and it's also a um, it goes to show that um, our what we may assume to be one thing may may not be actually in the glass and I think what happened was it wasn't ever intended to cause quite such distress it was intended simply to give California a little bit of publicity it, it ended up giving California a huge amount of publicity and still does to this day so 45 years later Cheers to Stephen. Um, he brought to the world and to the world's attention this extraordinary quality um, that could be found, is found still to this day. And more importantly, I think gave Californian wine industry a sense of purpose, a sense of place, a sense of being absolutely um, ready to, uh, to take on a position in the, on the world's wine stage. And I think that ambition um, has been um, a, a guiding light through the last 45 years to the point the where we are today, um, where some extraordinary wines are being made and, and can certainly take on any, any uh, area or region um, uh, and, and, and possibly win. So um, as I say, cheers to Stephen, who um, was, uh, an extraordinary pioneer in his own right and an absolute gentleman. Now, some of you might, thought, might have thought that I would probably start here. This is, um, this is Napa. Uh, this is the beautiful uh, spreading oak tree that is um, um, found in Chapelet vineyards, which is on Pritchard Hill uh, on the eastern side of the Napa Valley. Um, a very beautiful estate, a really um, extraordinary view that stretches down forever, down towards or up towards Mount St. Helena. And Chapelet um, is a sort of quintessential Napa Valley uh, estate, family owned. Uh, over 90% of Napa Valley estates are still family owned. I decided not to spend a huge amount of time or even find a wine from Napa to taste with you today, partly because Napa is very well known. Um, it's done an extraordinary job. Uh, it's a tiny, tiny valley. It's 30 miles long, only a few miles wide. Um, it became a, uh, an AVA, so an American viticultural area, only in 1981. So we're talking very recent history, but it was the first American AVA, uh, which again, I think gives you a sense of just how new um, California wine is in terms of um, hierarchy and appellation systems when you compare that to the rest of the world, or certainly when you compare that to Europe. Napa is an extraordinary, wine producing region. Um, it knows it. It has it is, it is been a, a very good self-publicist. Um, it has managed to sort of create premium wines and has had um, every uh, opportunity and certainly continues to have every opportunity to charge whatever it likes for its wines. And one of the reasons I'm not drinking a Napa Cabernet uh, this morning with you is uh, because I can't afford it. Um, they are, they are beautiful. There are some beautiful wines being made here in Napa. It's not all Cabernet, it's not all Chardonnay. There is diversity in this valley. Um, and if you come to Napa, 
you along with the millions that do come every year, um, you will get to taste all sorts of different varieties here in Napa Valley. Um, it, it, it's, it's been responsible for over 300,000 jobs in the wine industry. Um, it, uh, even though it only makes 4% of the Californian uh, grape harvest, um, it actually contributes billions of dollars uh, to the US economy. So in terms of, in terms of what it's done, uh, Napa Valley really has to sort of take uh, a huge amount of credit um, for, uh, for, for putting California on the map. But what I decided to do instead of, uh, instead of concentrating on Napa um, was actually to uh, to talk a little bit more about Sonoma. So it's 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 neighbour. Um, Sonoma is a much much larger wine region than than Napa. Um, it spreads all the way up from um, from north of San Francisco um, all the way up the coastline. So actually, Sonoma what Sonoma enjoys is a a much more coastal influenced um, growing region. It has more mountains, more valleys much larger, longer, wider, and therefore more variety. Um, and perhaps rather than being in the shadow of um, its more illustrious Napa neighbor, what Sonoma has done is actually uh, shaken off those shackles and done what it, done what it wants to do, has, has, has been more innovative. Um, and so the wine I chose for Sonoma is actually a Pinot Noir, in a can. <laughs> um, so I don't know what, what you feel about wine in cans. Um, certainly it is a, uh, a big phenomena here in, in, in the US. Um, this one is one of the wines that I work with um, very closely. This is from Coppola, Francis Ford Coppola's winery. Uh, he has a, an estate um, up in the northern part of Sonoma, where they make the wine uh, and bottle the wine. Uh, he also has a very beautiful Napa estate called Inglenook, um, where, uh, where there's more of a sort of concentration on Cabernet and, and so forth. But his Sonoma production um, is all about enjoyment. It's all about fruit and, um, and pleasure and um, uh, beach life and taking your can to the, uh, to the park and the picnics and so forth. Um, I have a bit of a problem drinking drinking wine out of a can. I actually much prefer to just pour it out. Um, but the wine itself is uh, is phenomenal. It does it does everything it says it does on the can. So it has that really lovely Pinot Noir uh, exuberance, the raspberry, the strawberry, all about immediate pleasure, immediate gratification. And I think Sonoma really is somewhere, um, if you're looking for high quality without the Napa price tag, then Sonoma is definitely the, 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 the wines you should be seeking out. And they have a wider range. So you have your Pinot Noirs, your Chardonnays, but you also have your Bordeaux blends, your Cabernets, your Merlots and so forth. It's very beautiful. Sonoma is a really very beautiful part of the world um, and, and, and has retained a certain sort of um, bucolic charm um, which is a well worth exploring. We're going to move upwards north, ca carry on north um, uh, and we're coming to um, the area of California that I perhaps um, uh, know the best in terms of um, vacation, in terms of holiday. Um, we're going up the Mendocino coastline. Um, this is the wild and very beautiful and very green part of California. Obviously, we're approaching the Oregon border, although we have a long way still to go. This long, long stretch of redwood forests um, uh, and vineyards that are pocketed in and around um, a little further inland because the coastline up here on the Mendocino coast is very rugged. Um, this is where we get the storms. This is where we get beaches that are full of huge boulders that have been sort of brought up uh, from the ocean, really rugged, um, uh, windy. Um, so a lot of the vineyards are actually tucked in the more sort of sheltered areas, slightly inland, um, but they compete with forests. They compete with this emerald 
um, emerald forest redwood um, background. And a lot of the wines and certainly um, uh, older style, more traditional wines from this area are actually aged in big redwood casks, uh, barrels, um, which um, uh, is more porous. Uh, so you have more sort of oxygenated. So these are wines that are really ready for drinking immediately and don't necessarily age quite as well as some of the wines from, from to, to the south that have been um, aged in French barrels and, and given a sort of polished treatment. The wines from the Mendocino coastline are, um, I would say, match their environment. They're slightly wilder, uh, they're slightly more rustic, uh, for want of a better word. And rustic, I, I love rustic, and there's nothing wrong with that. But it's, it's wines that are made to be drunk with the produce from the sea, um, the abalone shell, which is the, the picture I chose to represent um, this part of California. This is where Californians from the Bay go for camping holidays. This is where we take our camper and go up to the wilds and, and literally um, uh, eat crab and abalone that, is, that, is, that we've gone and died for that day and brought to the campfire and, um, and, and, a, and a sort of roasting. Um, and, and it's a very, um, it's a very uh, casual, laid back, surfing type, um, outdoor environment. It is also um, the Emerald Trigal in, in California is also the absolute hub of uh, cannabis marijuana uh, plantation, always has been uh, long before, uh, before it was legal. This is where all the illegal grows were because it, it's so remote up there. Um, and so bit by bit, those have been uh, uh, brought to light um, there is a real movement up there to try and make everybody legal. Um, it's not as easy as all that. I think they've had quite a few problems. Um, but it does compete up there with the yes. And um, the fear, obviously, is that um, if there is more money to be made from planting cannabis, then uh, why plant vineyards? So again, we will see whether um, that comes to light. But there are a plethora of small appellations up there on the Mendocino coast. Lake County is one that I would recommend you look for. Um, some beautiful Sauvignon Blanc from then. Again, this sort of freshness up there allows for white grape varieties to really thrive. Um, you have Anderson Valley, uh, known for its Pinot Noir, which is used in sparkling wine. Again, because the acidity there that is achieved from the freshness uh, makes it the perfect uh, environment for grapes that will then eventually be made into sparkling wine. Um, you have Ukiah and Talmage and Potter's Bowl, um, uh, McDowell Valley, Eagle Peak. Um, these are all areas of um, vineyards and winemaking areas, which I never knew about before I moved here, um, but I am constantly surprised and excited by the quality, um, especially if you're looking just for something for the everyday. Um, which most of us, I think, probably probably are. And really, that's that's our whistle stop tour through uh, through California. Um, I I appreciate that um, uh, this is way too fast, and and there is way too much uh, to talk about in each of these specific regions. And I haven't even mentioned Lodi and Amador, which is in the inland the Sierra foothills uh, where the gold rush started and you can still visit the gold mines and taste the wines um, because that's where some of the very oldest vines are planted in California, planted by thirsty miners um, uh, and especially Zinfandel um, where you have these beautiful old, old vines. So another tour, another trip, we should go inland and sort of come back down if you like and go back through the Central Valley and come all the way back down to the south, but I hope that it's given you at least uh, an indication of the eclectic nature, the, 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 the diversity on offer here in California. Um, uh, I couldn't be happier as a wine person to be living here, not just uh, because of the um, amount of different wines that I can taste and that I can source, but for the, for the real sense of there being um, a purpose, uh, a progress, 
uh, an idea of anything being possible, uh, the potential of this land. Um, I love watching the, um, the, the, the sort of struggle, if you like, um, uh, to create something even better here um, in a way that maybe, um, and I, I, I will be shocked for saying it, but maybe I wasn't quite so in tune with that in Bordeaux, um, where things went on the way they had always gone on and there was a ready market for whatever was being produced. California isn't like that. California is all about having to be good, having to be the best, um, because there will always be competition. In this case, possibly marijuana, it used to be fruits, almonds and plums and so forth. So vineyards and vines and grapes have to be good uh, in order to survive. Um, and they have to be clever as well in order to get through the various things that nature throws at us. Um, I do want to do um, one last thing before a very important thing. The, last, the, la the, the one last thing was to say, if you are interested in California, there is going to be a really lovely book uh, published um, towards the end of this year, uh, I think in October, although I think there'll be pre-sale in September. It's called On California, um, and it, it's, it, it'll be a, uh, a compendium of essays, um, both from past writers, uh, current writers, um, really exploring and celebrating uh, wine in California. And uh, there's an email there if you're interested and you can um, get a, there'll be a, a discount code for its publication towards the end of the year. And yes, I have contributed to it. So, um, so that is my reason for the plug. Um, but last and most importantly, I wanted to wish my father a happy birthday because I can see him. He's on the he's on my screen. Um, Dr. Barry Brown, OBE. He is a Clare College um, alumni and uh, and I wanted to say happy birthday, Daddy. And cheers to you. <laughs> so thank you very much. And I hope I hope we have some questions. Well, thank you so much, Claire. That that was absolutely fascinating. And I have to say, um, myself and Shannon here in the office are feeling rather jealous. <laughs> um, it, come to um, California. Come to yeah, California. When, I, when we yes, can all again, <laughs> please do. We'll, we'll be there. Um, I actually had a question. Um, you've shown us some really beautiful places. And I was just wondering um, how much you feel the enjoyment that you get from wine comes from being in that place and, you know, smelling all the smells and yeah. everything you, you about Celia, it. Celia, that's such, such a good question. And funnily enough, I was about, I'm, I'm in the process of writing a little piece about just that. Is it important? Um, and to answer your question, yes, I think it is hugely important or, or rather um, hugely uh, advantageous, beneficial, uh, adding to the experience, being able to sit somewhere where the wines have come from and enjoy the, the scenery and the hospitality and the food and the, the culture, because of course, all of those things are represented in some form or other in the wines that are produced. I think what we've had to learn over the last 18 months with the world closing down is that we won't necessarily get that opportunity in the same, we can't take advantage of it in the same way as we thought we always would be able to. And therefore we have to find other ways to do so um, in the hope that the day will come where we will travel and get back into our um, you know, Tuscan setting if we're into our Chiantis or our Bordeaux setting, Chateau if we love our Bordeaux. Um, I think, um, more specifically, I think the air quality, the different air quality, the different temperatures, um, the smells that are here, um, I think sitting in that and tasting the wine does make a difference. Um, it, it's captured in your own uh, perception, in your, in your own um, ability to, um, uh, uh, to taste and to smell. Um, and therefore, um, wines do taste different <laughs> uh, when they are tasted and drunk um, in, in the place they were made. Yes, I do do think that. Um, does it mean that you can't enjoy them elsewhere? No, not at all. Of course, you can enjoy them. In fact, it's very exciting to taste a wine uh, that you may have tasted on holiday or, uh, you know, to open a Napa Chardonnay whilst you're sitting in rainy Reading and think, gosh, can't I, can't I taste the sunshine? you know, shut my eyes for two minutes and I'm there. So, 
you know, I think it's about, um, I think it's just about opening the wine, pouring it wherever you are. And, um, and, and absolutely, if you have an opportunity, come to California and see it for yourself, for sure. Absolutely. I'll be there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a, a couple of questions on the chat. Uh, what, and this one is from Roger Stokes. What will the effect of growing global heating and increasing droughts be? Yes. Um, uh, Roger, that's a very, very pertinent question. It's a question that we ask ourselves here, specific, especially, um, and actually especially this year, because we're, we're approaching, we are in another drought. Um, the effect is, uh, is massive, will continue to be, um, could be catastrophic. Um, uh, the ways that the industry are trying to deal with it, mitigate it, are, um, are various fold. So firstly, um, water management has become the main, uh, the main sort of message um, uh, there are strict limitations on irrigation. Um, there's strict limitations on when you can irrigate, how much you can irrigate. Um, bearing in mind that you know you can irrigate here, you have to irrigate. So 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 that has come into force more and more over the over the decades. Um, lots of different ways of measuring that water um, consumption and measuring what is really required. Um, so sap sensors. Um, water bombs in the vineyards that they that they can sort of measure the uptake in the soil. Um, so a lot of technology is being used to um, uh, and of course we're at the you know we, we we have Silicon Valley just down the road we have we have brains um, here who are uh, constantly looking for sort of technology and, and, and ways to counter uh, what nature is doing. Um, but other things are also being done the choice of of grape varieties that are planted, the choice of rootstocks that are being used, certain rootstocks, vines that are grafted onto rootstocks, certain rootstocks are more drought tolerant, um, and, and also certain clones that they use for, um, for the actual grape varieties. Some are more tolerant than others to, to water stress and to heat stress. Um, and, and also where these vineyards are planted. Um, uh, so there's no more vineyards being planted in Napa, very few vineyards being planted in Sonoma. Um, Santa Barbara is under a certain limitation as well. There are more vineyards planted up to the north where there is more rainfall, um, but certainly areas that are already struggling have been told to stop. Um, and, uh, you know, finally, I think, um, you know, ultimately there's a sense of, well, um, we will do what we can until we can't do it anymore. Um, and then we'll have to stop. Um, but it's certainly, it's certainly on everybody's mind, the, the sort of sustainable, um, uh, if, I, if I hear that word one more time, you know, I must have heard it a million times. It's, 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 it's very much top of mind. Of course it is here. Um, and every year we face it and every year uh, as the fires ravage and we, it's already started to the north of us up in uh, with the heat wave in Oregon and Washington, um, we, we, we are aware that this is knife edge and that, this is, um, and that we will do all we can um, until, we, until, it, until it doesn't work. I hope that answers some of the question anyway. Thank you. Um, next question is from Ian West. How would you rank Californian wine compared to other New World producers? Yes, that's, that's a really good question too. So um, uh, it depends. It depends on uh, which areas of California you're looking at. So there are certain similarities between um, Central Valley Californian wine production and Central Valley Chilean production, for example. Um, uh, and there are certain um, similarities actually between the sort of more premium areas like Napa uh, and Sonoma and premium areas of Australia like Margaret River, um, even in sort of stylistically. Um, I would say that California, and I may be biased here, but I would say that California still has the edge on most other New World wine regions simply because of its diversity, simply because it is able to produce um, everything from peak pool to Gamay to Cabernet to Pinot to Chardonnay to Zinfandel and so on and so forth in a way that most other New World regions have decided to focus more intently on a handful of 
um, international varieties in order to get their wines um, exported. California hasn't done that. It doesn't, hasn't really needed to in quite the same way because it has such a ready market. It has the tourism market, it has its local market, it has the wider US market. And therefore diversity in California is, is more valuable uh, possibly than in other new world countries that have had to look outward um, for, their, uh, for their markets. Um, so I would rank it very, very highly. Um, having said that, um, I still think New Zealand uh, probably has the edge in terms of it, certainly of its Sauvignon Blanc and certainly in terms of its, um, well, I was going to say Pinot Noir, but actually maybe not. I think um, California uh, produces some extraordinary Pinot. Um, and there are pockets in South Africa, uh, Chile, Argentina that are making um, extraordinarily good wines. And I would argue that what the, the where, where they're most successful is where they have concentrated on the more indigenous variety, a variety that is only planted there or that they have made their own. So Argentina, uh, Malbec, for example, uh, from Cuyo, De Luco and, and, the, and the Mendoza altitude uh, is exceptional, can be exceptional and is not is not found uh, in, in the same way, uh, is not matched in the same way in California. I hope that. I hope that answers that one. Thank you. So we we did have a question from Naomi, but I think it's probably quite similar to to Rogers as she as she pointed Talks about out. Uh huh. Yeah. Hi, so Naomi. It, it was to do with I hope climate change. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we we had another question from the office. Um, what would you say is the next Californian uh, wine to look out for? Um. So. Uh, so California and, uh, the, and the states in general is um, very celebrity driven, very um, entertainment driven. Uh, it likes its trends. Um, so the cans, for example, um, you know, there was a reason for opening this. Um, you know, you will see more and more of this. And it kind of started over here, really. Um, uh, I think also what is very important to, um, to bear in mind with California is even though there is this idea of trying and testing new things, you may have seen uh, bourbon barrel aged wine coming to the UK, for example, from California. That was a big thing a couple of years ago here. Um, this idea of, of, of putting your, aging your wine in bourbon barrels, giving it a, just a slight kind of smoky toffee note to it. Um, uh, and that seems to have sort of, that, that's waning a little here, um, there's a little bit less of that. Um, the red blend really started here, was a sort of a big um, idea of being able to sort of put all sorts of different things together and create a, uh, a, a um, more of a kind of experience wine rather than a typical single variety um, style. Um, that continues, the red blend is a hugely important um, component to especially to exports from California but I would say that the wines really to sort of latch on to unless you have a lot of money in which case go for your Cabernets wonderful um, I would say Zinfandel you know Zinfandel is a is a is a native um, uh, Californian grape variety um, it is also in uh, Italy it's called Primitivo in Italy um, but Zinfandel is was one of the one of the oldest uh, grape varieties planted here in California, and it continues to be enormously um, protected. Um, it's greatly loved here. Um, Zinfandel vineyards are protected and 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 tend to sort of produce uh, can can age very well. Um, and so you've got some really beautiful Zinfandel still being produced here. And I think you always will. I think it's. I mentioned the Malbec from Argentina. I think Zinfandel from California. Uh, iconic and um, but also very friendly style it's a it's a great variety that makes wines that um, are very approachable very flavorful very fruity all the things that we probably really want from wine <laughs> certainly on our table and to share with uh, to share with friends and to share with family so always look for a Zinfandel great thank you so there are no more questions in the chat. Um, I don't know if anyone has any any last minute questions. I just want to know whether anyone is actually drinking any Californian wine. 
Yes, yeah, so um, <laughs> there were a few mentioned at the beginning. We have uh, Roger is drinking um, F. Stephen Millier Merlot. Oh, lovely. I, and, you know, I know Stephen Millier. He, he, he's in Lodi and I work with him. He's a, he's a lovely man and um, we do a number of wines actually with him still. So that's, that's wonderful that you're drinking one of his wines. <laughs> uh, Ian West is drinking um, Ironstone Petite Syrah. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Petite Syrah. Gosh, I can't believe I didn't mention Petite Syrah. It's one of my favourite grape varieties here. It's not Syrah and it's not in any way petite. It's a huge um, uh, grape variety or, or rather it produces huge wines, really deeply colored, really beautiful, like inky. So you can sort of put your fingers in it and, and, and finger paint with it. It's a beautifully dark. Um, and for me, always smells like Ribena, Ribena berries. Um, so you've got, so look out for Petite Syrah if you like Ribena um, <laughs> and who doesn't? Um, uh, because you get this, Fabulous sort of cassis um, ribena berry. So mm, delicious. Yeah, I love Petit Sera. Uh, Philip Brown is drinking a chilled Highland Spring. Oh, is he now? <laughs> Philip is my brother. Ah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So I think it just leaves me to say a very, very big thank you again um to you You're Claire welcome. very happy birthday to you Barry thank uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to everybody else for joining us um it's been really enjoyable and Wonderful. as I said it will be the the recorded um talk will be available on the website tomorrow so we can uh check which wines to go and buy next time <laughs> super well I as I say all I hope is that if you aren't drinking Californian wine now you perhaps will think to do so the next time you go looking for a bottle of wine. I hope you enjoy it. And, um, and here's to all of us. Um, and thank you so much for asking me uh, to do this. I appreciate it. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs>